True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Tiso Blackstar Group, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live, and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Tiso Blackstar Group or its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm your host, Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to Episode 10, The Unsolved Murder of Tracy Thompson. I first heard about this case from a friend of mine, Lee Both. I just started the blog, not even the podcast yet, and she mentioned a case that she knew about from the East Rand of Gauteng. I'm an old East Rand girl myself, having been born and raised in Boxburg and Kempton Park. Okay, now I feel like you know too much about me. She knew the names of the victim and her mom, but couldn't quite remember the details of the story. She knew it was a tragic story, and still unsolved. Lee whatsapped her sister, and got the exact names and details. She even got the victim's mom's cell number, and there was a Facebook page. She gave me the name and I briefly looked at it, saved the lady's number and decided to look into it at a later stage. After I started the podcast, I looked at the Facebook page again. It's in the name of the victim's mother, Carol Thompson. The page held a bit of information and a link to a book entitled Betrayed, A Mother's Battle for Justice. I don't usually contact family members of victims unless they make it known that they're willing to talk. I don't feel that it's my place. But Carol was vocal about her daughter's case on Facebook. And she'd written a book. So I figured it would be okay. She responded very quickly, saying that she was happy for me to cover the case. I told her that I was going to read her book and she offered me her copy. I gratefully declined, as I like to have my own copy of these books so that I can refer back to them if there's ever any questions. It would be another three months before I could turn my attention back to covering this case. I found the book on Amazon and read it, open-mouthed at times. Carol's daughter Tracy became very real in my mind, and the injustices that she and her family suffered not only at the hands of one person who thought it was their right to take Tracy's life, but also then at the hands of the system that was supposed to protect them and bring them justice, resolution and closure, convinced me that I needed to tell Tracy's story. In terms of sources, the main one I used was the book written by Roxanne Raid in conjunction with Carol Thompson. And I acknowledge that most of the information I'm going to share with you here is from her book, which I'll link in the show notes. Please take note that some names have been changed as they were in the book. Tracy and her family members' names are unchanged. Let's get into Tracy's story. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Tracy was born to parents Carol and Buddy Thompson on the 21st of August 1980. When I figured out that this was her birth date, it really hit home. I was born in 1980. Tracy was born just 10 days before me. We even lived in the same area at the same time. Carol describes Tracy vividly in the book. She doesn't just share the events around Tracy's loss. She describes portions of Tracy's life from the day she was born, which all stitched together to make her the person that she was. I'd like to do the same here, as this is a unique opportunity to really be a voice for the victim. Carol describes Tracy as having been a very active, energetic and strong-willed child. But paired with this, 
she comes across as having been very gentle and caring as well, and she had a very strong bond with her younger brother Glenn. Carol says that although she was well disciplined, Tracy's strong will and natural leadership ability often got her into trouble. When Tracy was three years old, her mother enrolled her in a nursery school. She'd only been there for a few days when Carol received a panicked telephone call from the nursery school teacher, telling her that all of the children, including Tracy, were missing. Carol recalls the blind panic of driving to the nursery school that day, terrified that she might never see her daughter again. When she arrived, she was shown the empty playground and quickly found a small hole at the bottom of the fence through which she believed the children had escaped. Carol got into her car and drove the streets around the school. Just a few blocks away, she spotted a line of children being led by her very own daughter. Pulling up next to them, she berated Tracy for leaving the school premises. She replied that she was sorry, but they just wanted to explore. And then they got lost, so they were heading for the police station because she knew the police would help them. While this is a really sweet story, and a testament to Tracy's tenacity, even as a small child, in hindsight, it's also darkly sad, because Tracy and her family's trust in the police would eventually be completely annihilated. When Tracy was four years old, she contracted a virus in her eyes. Despite Carol's concerted efforts to help her daughter, Tracy would eventually lose partial sight in her right eye. This impediment certainly didn't seem to get Tracy down, though, and her fighting spirit won out, with her adapting to the change readily. An event that would happen when Tracy was five years old, however, would be far more difficult for her to overcome, and it would have far-reaching effects on her life. Carol and Tracy went to a local shopping centre one day, and while Carol was picking some groceries off the shelf, Tracy asked if she could quickly go and look at something in the next aisle. Carol agreed, warning Tracy to come right back and not to wander off. Carol continued what she was doing, and a very short while later she felt Tracy's tiny hand slip back into hers. She looked down, to find a very different child than the one who had skipped away just minutes before. Tracy was unresponsive. Hanging her head and tears rolled down her cheeks, but no sound escaped. Terrified that she'd suddenly become ill, Carol abandoned her shopping and loaded Tracy in the car. It was then that she noticed that her daughter had wet herself. Tracy's demeanour remained subdued for the next few days and Carol could not get her to tell her what had upset her so badly. Carol contacted their family doctor, who recommended she take Tracy to a child psychologist. The weekend before the appointment with the psychologist, Carol needed to go back to the shopping centre, and when she told Tracy to get ready to go, she became extremely distressed. Although Carol was able to eventually convince Tracy to accompany her to the shopping centre, She clung to her mother in a way she never had in her life. Carol recalled walking past a photo booth, placed in the middle of the centre, and the curtain briefly moved as she caught sight of an older man, who instantly gave her the creeps. He was dishevelled, his hair was greasy, and his fingernails were dirty. At that moment, Carol felt her daughter freeze beside her. Tracy screamed out, It's him! and ran off through the centre. The man whipped back the curtain, and with a horrified look on his face, fled in the opposite direction. Carol reported the man to the police and the shopping centre management. They were well aware of him, and were in the process of building a case against him for other complaints. The man was removed from the shopping centre and arrested. During his trial, it emerged that he had molested several young children. Thankfully, the evidence against him was sufficient enough that Tracy did not have to testify, and he was sent to prison. Carol recalled hearing a while later 
that he had been beaten within an inch of his life while in jail because of his acts against children. Sadly, while Carol and her husband sent Tracy to many psychologists and trauma counsellors, they were never able to get the full story of what happened that day out of her. Tracy locked the incident away, deep inside, and although she would slowly heal back into a semblance of the bubbly, confident child she once was, the scars of that moment of abuse stayed with her her entire life. Carol recalls that from that day, Tracy would not wear clothing she felt revealing. She wore baggy t-shirts almost all the time, anything she could not to draw attention to herself. In reading about some of the activities that Tracy took part in when she was a child, I feel like she was an extremely caring person. Despite her experiences, she continued to stand up for those who she felt were the underdogs. Carol was once called to Tracy's school because she'd beaten up several boys who'd been bullying a younger boy. She took them on single-handedly, and they never went near the younger child again. When she was 11, Tracy volunteered at a children's home, spending her weekends playing soccer with and teaching karate to the children there. Carol recalled that she'd become very attached to a tiny baby who'd been abandoned. The little girl was sadly HIV positive. Carol and her husband noticed that Tracy was becoming quite low and convinced her that she needed a break from visiting the orphanage. Although tenacious Tracy would never admit it, her parents thought that the deep issues that were brought to the forefront at the orphanage of abandonment and death were just too much for someone so young to be dealing with. Tracy had agreed to take a break and continued with her sports activities, which were always a huge part of her life. During the break, Tracy would often wonder about the baby she had become so attached to. Her mother assured her that if something happened, she was sure the orphanage would call to let them know. A few months later, Tracy wanted to pay the home a visit again to say hello to the children and see how the baby was doing. Carol recalled dropping her off, and only minutes later, seeing Tracy running back out in floods of tears. The baby she had cared for had passed away from HIV complications. Tracy was devastated that she hadn't had the opportunity to say goodbye. In reading this story, I was absolutely blown away by Tracy's compassion. For someone so young to not only give up her time to visit and engage with children less fortunate than her, but to also have such a devastating reaction to the loss of one of the babies, is so rare. Tracy really was a very special person. As Tracy entered her teens, Carol struggled with mood swings and behaviour from her daughter that she was not used to seeing. She put it down to normal teenage behaviour and struggles at the time, having no reason to think otherwise. But she would later find out that Tracy's difficulties ran far deeper at this time than anyone knew. After a few run-ins with fellow pupils, Carol changed Tracy to a different school, and she seemed to start doing better. Despite Carol's attempts to try and get Tracy to see a psychologist, to hopefully talk through some of the issues that were bothering her, Tracy just wouldn't talk and seemed to want to try and figure out her own way through her troubles. It eventually emerged that Tracy was struggling to deal with the loss of seven friends in five car accidents in the preceding year. Dealing with so much death at such a young age had been very difficult for Tracy to process, and psychiatrists discovered that she had a chemical imbalance and she was placed on medication to assist her. When Tracy was 16, she met a man who would have a great impact on her life. Peter was 10 years older than Tracy, and the age gap was evident to all and a concern even to the young couple themselves. Their relationship would be off and on continuously, but Carol explains that she liked Peter, and he was always respectful towards Tracy, so they left it to their daughter to decide whether the relationship was good for her. 
The couple's relationship went on for three years, through Tracy's matriculation. Tracy and Peter had been broken up. When Peter suffered complications one night while using cocaine with a friend, and passed away. Tracy was devastated. In a deep pit of despair, Tracy decided that she wanted to come off her medication because she said that she didn't want chemicals controlling her. Carol didn't think it was a good idea, but Tracy was now an adult and she could decide for herself. Slowly, she managed to move through her grief and started at a teacher's college. During this time, Tracy became involved in a same-sex relationship and moved in with her partner. She arrived at her parents' home one night in tears, with purple bruises around her neck. She ended the abusive relationship and moved back home. Not long after Tracy moved back home, Carol became aware that her daughter's demeanour was changing. Her loving daughter was becoming nasty and she was quick to anger. Carol discovered that Tracy was on drugs. She had started using ecstasy and dacha. Carol, to her credit, practiced the tough love that is necessary with an addict, and Tracy would eventually book herself into the Elam Clinic, a rehabilitation facility in Kempton Park. Tracy worked closely with the therapists at Elam, and on a weekend break home, she broke some shocking news to her mother. When Tracy was 13 years old, she had been raped. Carol described feeling like the world was caving in on her. She had had no idea. Tracy had been taken to psychologists at the time, but she hadn't breathed a word of the attack to them either. Tracy would not tell Carol who had raped her, but she did say that it was someone that she knew and trusted. Carol had wanted to call the police, open a case, lay charges, but Tracy refused. She said that she'd forgiven her attacker and she didn't want to have to relive anything. Carol says that Tracy worked very hard to get clean and found a new job. It was at this new place of work that she met Vilma. Tracy wanted to be living on her own again, and it was soon arranged that Tracy, Vilma, and two other friends would move into a cottage on a small holding in Benoni. The two other friends were Wally, who was in a relationship with Vilma, and Trudy, who was a close friend of Tracy's. Carol understood that the arrangement was that Tracy would provide her housemates with transport, as she was the only one with a vehicle as her contribution to the rent. The company that Tracy and Vilma were working at had Tracy on a three-month probation, but they had promised that it was just a formality and she'd be made permanent after the three months. Carol recalls that in early March 2005, Tracy had contacted her and said that her living arrangement was not working and she asked whether she and her friend Trudy could move in with them. Carol agreed and Tracy said that she and Trudy would come through the following week to discuss the logistics. Tracy also told her mother that she'd been told by the company she worked for that she would not be made permanent after her probation ended. Tracy had been very confused because this had never been the arrangement. She would later find out that Vilma had been sending emails to her boss telling lies to make her look bad. This had been the reason that the company decided not to take her on. Carol would later say that when she had that conversation with Tracy, she felt like there was something more that her daughter wanted to say about her housemates, but she hadn't. This would become part of the mystery that would soon envelop the Thompson family. Tracy was going to be informing her housemates that she was moving out that weekend. I recently read a South African true crime book, which I have to tell you about. It's a new publication by Jonathan Bull Publishers, 
and it's called Blood on Her Hands. The book is written by Tanya Faber, who is an award-winning journalist currently working at the Sunday Times. Tanya has covered many South African murder cases in her career, and her passion for the genre really shines through in this book. Blood on Her Hands is an investigation into the most notorious female killers in South African history. I'm generally a fast reader, but this book took the cake, and I devoured it in three sittings. The book is divided into a section for each female killer it covers, so it makes for brilliant in-between stuff reading, where you can sneak a section in at a time if you have a few minutes downtime. Each section starts with a brief introduction into the mindset of the killer in question, where Faber cleverly uses a small amount of poetic license to really draw the reader into the female killer's world, and then she moves into the factual account of the woman's crimes, her conviction, and sentence. This book has given me so many ideas for cases to cover on the podcast, so you're going to be hearing the name Blood on Her Hands a lot, as I reference it as a source in future episodes. Some of the killers covered are the infamous Daisy DeMalka. I had no idea how prolific a killer she actually was. Marlene Lenberg, known as the Scissors Killer, and Joey Harhoff. And let me tell you, after reading Faber's account of this woman's role in the Gert van Royen kidnappings, you will never think about her as his subdued sidekick again. Some of the more recent cases covered include baby killer Dina Rodriguez and matricide offender Phoenix Tehran, who was not only a female killer, but also one of the few cases in the world where a female teenager killed her mother. Oh, and I also have to mention Shawnee van Heerden, who was one of the few female killers ever in South Africa, to be named a highly dangerous offender with little possibility of rehabilitation by the judge. Okay, I'm not going to tell you about any of the others, because you just have to go and buy this book. If you're a true crime fan, and you can only buy yourself one book this year, it has got to be Blood on Your Hands. Blood on Your Hands is available in all good bookstores, and on Take A Lot, so you don't even need to leave the house to get it. I'll leave a link in the show notes, to buy the book through Take A Lot. On Friday, the 11th of March, 2005, Carol's phone rang. It was her nephew asking her if her car had been stolen. Carol initially thought that he was talking about the Corolla that she drove, and she laughed with relief into the handset, as she could see it sitting in the driveway through the window. He clarified that he didn't mean the Corolla that she drove, but rather the Corsa that was registered in her name, but Tracy drove. Carol's nephew had received a call from police that morning. His business card had been found on the floorboard of an abandoned Corsa. The vehicle was parked on the side of the highway, near the off-ramp to Tembisa, a large township on the East Rand. There was no one in or around the vehicle, and the keys were still in the ignition. Carol put down the phone, and it immediately rang again. This time it was the police. They explained that there was no signs of violence in the vehicle. She immediately thought that was a strange statement, as she knew the car had a smashed back window, It had been broken a few days before. Carol asked the officer how the driver's seat had been positioned. Was it pushed all the way back or forward? The officer had no idea. The reason Carol asked this question was because Tracy was not very tall, and if the seat was pushed back, she would know that her daughter was not the last person to drive the vehicle. Irritated with police, She wanted to get off the phone and try and get hold of Tracy. The minute she replaced the receiver, though, it rang for a third time. It was Trudy, Tracy's housemate and friend. She asked Carol if Tracy had slept at her house the night before, 
because she hadn't come home. Carol's stomach twisted. She had hoped up until that moment that Tracy had been safe somewhere and simply not realised that her car had been stolen yet. Now she knew that this was not the case. Her daughter was missing. Carol phoned the police station and requested that an officer come to her house so that she could fill out a missing persons report. While she waited, she made phone calls. Every person she could think of. Then hospitals and finally mortuaries. Tracy was nowhere to be found. One of Carol's friends came to help make phone calls and she was even more thankful for her presence when the police officer arrived to take her report. Carol describes hitting a complete blank when the officer asked her for a description of Tracy. Her friend provided the details. Carol asked the officer if he would need a photograph of Tracy. He said it wouldn't be necessary. Yes, you heard that correctly. A policeman said that he didn't need a photograph of a missing person. Carol was stunned. She asked how he would be able to identify Tracy if he didn't know what she looked like. Carol says that this seemed to make sense to him and he agreed that she should drop off a photograph at the station later in the day. Carol and her husband had been advised that they could collect Tracy's car from the impound lot at the police station, but first Carol wanted to go and see Tracy's housemates in person so that she could understand her daughter's last known movements. I just want to say at this point that the fact that Carol was already going to be allowed to collect the vehicle on the same day that her daughter went missing is a huge red flag to me. The vehicle belonged to a missing person. It was evidence, or at least it should have been. Carol drove out to the small holding where Tracy had shared a cottage with her three housemates. As she drove up to the cottage, Tracy's friend Trudy and the male housemate Wally approached her, but Vilma stayed in the doorway of the cottage. Neither one of the housemates looked Carol in the eyes. Wally immediately blurted out that he felt guilty because he had used Tracy's car the night before and returned it with almost no petrol in the tank. Carol found this strange because Tracy didn't like other people using her car. It didn't make sense that she would have let Wally use it. In the days before Tracy went missing, Carol had begun to suspect that her daughter had relapsed. Carol knew that Wally had used drugs in the past as well, and she asked him to phone his dealer to find out if he had seen Tracy. Carol thought that perhaps Tracy had bought drugs, used and was too ashamed to come home. On hearing her request, though, Wally immediately denied that he used drugs. Carol became enraged at his childish behaviour, telling him that her daughter's life was at risk and she didn't have time for his denials. He then claimed that he didn't have any airtime on his phone, so he couldn't call his dealer. Carol handed him her phone. He hesitantly took it and turned slightly away from her, dialing a number and then having a hushed conversation which lasted just a few seconds. He handed the phone back and told Carol that the dealer hadn't seen Tracy in a long time. Carol took back her phone and checked the outgoing call log. Wally hadn't phoned anyone. She turned on her heels and left. She would mention Wally's evasion and deceit to the police, she decided. Carol, her son Glenn and two other people then drove out to the area where Tracy's car had been found. There was a six kilometre stretch of land around the place where the car had been dumped. Although Carol remembers feeling drawn to search, they decided that the job was too large for four people and it was better left to the police. She then went to the police station to deliver Tracy's photograph and see if there was an update. Carol was told by an officer that she found at the station that the case would only be assigned to a detective on Monday, as they'd already all gone home for the weekend, and they only worked business hours. Carol was furious. 
When they had taken her report, no one had told her that her daughter's case file would lie in an inbox for more than 48 hours before someone looked at it. During the time that Tracy had been using drugs, Carol had come to know and respect her policeman from a police station close to the rehab centre. She called this officer, explained the situation, and asked if she could see him. He agreed. The officer turned out to be of little assistance. He was packing up to go home for the weekend and seemed more interested in complaining about his heavy caseload than giving Carol any advice on how to find her missing daughter. I have no doubt that knowing Tracy's history as a drug user, the policeman assumed that she had gone off on a binge and would resurface soon. This would be a fair enough assumption if her car had not been found abandoned. One small piece of information he did have to offer clarity on is why the officers that that found the car had not mentioned the smashed window. He said that because it was already covered in black plastic and there was no glass on the seats of the vehicle, they knew it didn't have anything to do with the car being abandoned there. If Carol describes Tracy as being tenacious and strong-willed, I think I know where she got it from because this mother would move mountains to find her daughter, and there was no way that she was going to sit at home for an entire weekend and wait for a detective to one day decide to look for her daughter. Carol remembered that the local 4x4 club had a search and rescue unit. She contacted them, and a member of the volunteer group was at her house within an hour. They not only arranged to start a search at 6am the next morning, but they managed to get the SAPS canine unit involved too. A representative from the 4x4 club and a member of the canine unit went to Tracy's cottage to retrieve a piece of clothing that they could use as a scent item for the dogs. The search was being conducted on the understanding that Carol was not allowed to go near the area while they were searching. She and Glenn spent that Saturday morning putting up posters instead. At midday, Carol was at home waiting for the phone to ring when a vehicle marked with the words search and rescue pulled into her driveway. Her heart sank. The SAPS K-9 unit had called off the search. They had found evidence of armed robberies and other violent crimes in the area and it was a hotbed for drug dealers. They decided it was too dangerous to continue the search. So it was too dangerous for volunteers and SAPS members, but never mind Tracy, who could possibly be out there. The volunteer told Carol that the dogs had not found any trace of Tracy's scent in the area. The only time they had alerted was to the scent of a decomposing cow head there was no indication that the search would be resumed at any time. Carol was left alone with her outrage. She grabbed a telephone directory and by comparing names on the SAPS website with names in the directory, she managed to find the private cell phone numbers of a senior superintendent. As the phone rang, Carol was certain that when she explained how inept his staff had been, he would be as angry as she was and finally something would start happening. When he answered, the senior superintendent was angry all right, but not for the reason Carol had thought he'd be. After she finished her explanation, he screamed at her down the phone, asking her who she thought she was phoning him on his private number. He went on to say that her daughter was probably out drinking for the weekend and would turn up on Monday with a sorry mom and then she would have wasted everyone's time. And then he hung up in her ear. Carol dialed the number again, and the senior not-so-superintendent had his phone turned off. Carol knew something was deeply wrong. Even in the height of Tracy's drug use, she had never disappeared off the radar completely like this. She would always phone her mother to let her know she was safe. On Sunday morning, Carol, undeterred by the man's rudeness, 
phoned the superintendent again. This time he answered, and she managed to convince him to meet her on Monday morning to discuss the way forward in the search for Tracy. Carol describes the initial days of Tracy's disappearance as extremely taxing on her family. Each member was trying to protect the other and in turn isolating themselves. Carol recalls that on the Sunday, 48 hours after Tracy had gone missing, she already had a deep feeling of foreboding that Tracy was no longer alive. I've heard this feeling described by many mothers of missing people. There's no doubt that there's an extremely strong connection between most mothers and their children. I say most, because it is of course not true for all. Many mothers who've lost children describe knowing before they were told that their children were no longer alive. Like a string that had been cut, a tether unwound. On the Monday morning, Carol and Glenn reported to the police station at the arranged time to see the senior superintendent. He barely even acknowledged them before passing them off to Captain Kotza, who he claimed was the best on the East Rand. None of the officers that Carol spoke to that morning knew anything about a missing person report for her daughter. She was told to go home and wait for Captain Kotza to contact her. In attempting to collect Tracy's car from the pound, Carol would be subjected to further incompetence and mistreatment. When she and Glenn arrived, the security guard barked at them that only one of them could come in. Carol went in while Glenn waited outside in the car. Carol remembers wandering around the facility for quite a while before eventually figuring out where she should be. She found a waiting room and sat down. She waited for three hours, before eventually losing her cool and pushing her way into the adjoining admin offices. A man, who appeared to be in charge, screamed at her, telling her that she had no right to be in there. Carol threatened to call a lawyer to deal with the situation, and the man directed one of his staff members to get this woman out of here and find out what her problem is. Well, her problem, sir, is that her daughter has been missing for four days and no one seems to give a damn. Another two hours would pass before Carol was eventually directed to collect her keys from the security guard. He couldn't find them. More time passed, as the staff bumbled around trying to figure out where the keys were, as they'd been signed into the register. Carol told them not to bother with the keys, as she'd arranged a low-bed truck to collect the vehicle. The staff informed her that she'd have to cancel the truck and come back the next day, as it was closing time now. Days ticked by without a word from the police. Carol continued on her crusade along with family and friends to try and find her daughter. A radio station allowed her to make an on-air appeal for anyone with information about Tracy's whereabouts to come forward. On the Wednesday morning following Tracy's disappearance, Carol heard a news story on the radio about the body of a young woman having been found. Carol immediately contacted the police to try and verify if it was Tracy. The police seemed to have no idea what she was talking about and couldn't offer her any confirmation. Carol then contacted the people at the radio station that had helped her with her plea. They were able to confirm from the information off the press release that the woman could not have been Tracy. Eventually having retrieved Tracy's car from the pound, they took it to a mechanic friend who checked the petrol tank. It was bone dry. Even to Carol's untrained eye, it was clear that no forensic search had been done in the vehicle. There was no fingerprint powder residue. Carol and Glenn searched the vehicle and found several items. They found a sock and a shirt that didn't belong to Tracy. They found several pieces of paper with telephone numbers written on them, not in Tracy's handwriting. There were till slips dated the day that she had gone missing. They also found a copper pendant that neither she nor Glenn had seen before. 
there was a bird on the pendant, which looked like the bird on the Zimbabwean flag. The seat was pushed all the way back. Carol knew that Tracy would never have been able to drive the vehicle like that, but she would never be able to ascertain whether the police had found it like that or if they had pushed the seat back. Carol continued to distribute flyers with Tracy's picture on them. Her employer paid for printing and laminating of some of the posters. Carol received a call from the missing persons unit. The person on the other side was asking what had happened to Tracy's case, because they had never received her file, so they assumed that she had been found. Tracy had been missing for almost a week, and her case file had still not made it, from the police station to the missing persons unit, tasked with finding her. Carol, fuming, phoned the police station. She was quite calmly told that they hadn't had time to run it over there yet, and they could probably get it there in the next week or so. Carol said she'd come to the police station and take it there herself, and the policeman grunted and said he'd do it by the end of the day. By this time, she had still not heard from Captain Kotza, who was supposed to be heading up the investigation, so she decided to make first contact. Kotza's cell phone was off, and his voicemail was full, and no longer taking messages. His landline also rang off without an answer. On Friday, exactly one week after Tracy had gone missing, Carol's son Glenn called her distraught and in tears. When he had arrived at work that morning, he'd been accosted by a strange man in the parking lot of the shopping centre where his office was located. The man had grabbed Glenn's shoulder and told him that he knew where Tracy was. He said that she was under a bridge in Benoni, and he insisted that Glenn needed to come with him. Glenn had been immediately fearful of the strange, wild-eyed man, and he'd fled inside and called the flying squad. The flying squad had told him that there was nothing that they could do, and he'd have to go to court and apply for a protection order. Carol, having gathered a list of names and numbers of senior officers in the police from her telephone directory searches, found the number for the man who was in charge of the flying squad in the area. She told him her story and demanded that he meet her at her son's place of work. By the time Carol got there, the flying squad had decided to turn up after all, presumably after instruction from their senior officer. They started talking to various tenants in the area, and it emerged that the man that had accosted Glenn was well known in the area as being mentally unstable. Police determined that he had seen Tracy's missing poster in the window of Glenn's car, and made up the story to get attention. The officer in charge of the flying squad recommended that Carol get in touch with the investigating officer so that he could figure out if there was any truth to the man's wild claims. In the book, Carol says that, magically, courts are answered on the first ring. I'm as convinced as I believe she was that there was no magic involved there. The story about the very angry mother, who was phoning senior police officers and telling them their fortune, had no doubt reached the police radios and Kortzer probably thought it in his best interests, that he answer his phone. He agreed to meet Carol at the shopping centre. He then phoned her five minutes later, saying that she should rather go home and he'd meet her there as he was running late. Carol was having none of it. Her daughter had been missing for a week, and she was finally able to contact the man who was supposed to be in charge of finding her for the first time there was no way that she was letting him slip away again. There was also CCTV footage that she wanted him to view of the man that had accosted Glenn. He agreed and arrived five hours later. Kotza had no interest in viewing the CCTV footage, saying that it would be a waste of time. Carol handed over the items that she'd found in Tracy's car. Kotzer threw the pieces of paper and receipts on the ground, claiming they had no value. 
Carol picked them up again and handed them back to him. I've never investigated a missing persons case, but I cannot believe that receipts found in Tracy's car from the day she went missing would have no value. It was already clear that someone else had been driving her vehicle. Those receipts could have identified that person. It would not have taken that much time to phone the stores and find out if they had CCTV. If they did. Receipts usually have a transaction time on them. Rewind the CCTV to the time and day of the transaction and see who made the purchase. If it was Tracy, great, then you can build a better timeline of her movements. If it wasn't Tracy, then you have a new person to speak to. I don't know. Maybe there's someone out there that deals with missing persons cases that can explain to me why that wouldn't be a viable course of action. Regardless, none of the information was ever followed up on. The wild-eyed stranger was never interviewed. And although it's quite possible that he was just seeking attention, as Carol says in the book, we'll now never know for sure. On arriving home, Carol received a phone call from a stranger. He claimed to have seen Tracy on the Thursday night that she went missing. He didn't want to give his name, nor go to the police, because he was married, and he claimed that at the time he'd seen Tracy, he was cruising sex clubs in Pretoria. He admitted that he'd had a lot to drink that night, but claimed that he never forgot a face, and when he had seen Tracy's missing poster, he was 100% sure that it was Tracy he had seen. Carol knew that because of Tracy's past experiences, she would only ever be in a sex club if she was being held against her will. She believed that the man had been mistaken, but knew that it was important information. For a moment, she says that she considered going there herself. For a moment, she says that she'd considered going to these sex clubs herself. But her husband had quite rightly talked her out of it. I don't know, Carol, but from the tenacity that she has shown so far, I could actually picture her going from club to club, demanding answers from pimps and prostitutes. Unfortunately, that would have been a very dangerous situation for her. So she did what we would all assume is the correct thing to do in that situation. She called Captain Kotza and gave him the information. He sounded intrigued and said he'd go out to the clubs immediately. Carol later found out that he never did. In the early hours of Sunday the 20th of March 2005, the telephone rang in the Thompson home. Carol answered. A young constable on the other end asked if that was Mrs. Thompson. She confirmed it was her stomach plummeting at the official tone of the call. The constable asked if they could come to the house in a few minutes to speak with her. Carol describes not being able to wait a minute longer to know what they wanted to tell her. She asked if they had found Tracy's body. The constable did not want to answer at first, but eventually told Carol that the body of a young girl matching Tracy's description had been found on the previous afternoon, and she would give him more information in person. Within a few minutes, a police car pulled into Carol's driveway. The female constable said nothing. She simply walked up to Carol and folded her into an embrace. She whispered in Carol's ear that she was a mother herself, and she could not allow a man to give her this news. The constables told Carol that on the previous afternoon, a farm labourer had been on his way home when he'd come across the body of a deceased female. The woman's shorts were pulled down to her ankles and her panties were removed, lying a few metres from her body. Her t-shirt and jersey had been pulled over her face and there was a rope around her neck. The farmer had called the police station and the young constables put two and two together with the missing posters they'd seen of Tracy. The farmer was told that a mortuary van would arrive to collect the body 
and a detective would attend the scene. A formal identification had not been made as yet, but the two young constables had felt that there was sufficient information to advise Carol of the discovery. The way in which Carol describes the kind actions of these two young constables is very telling. Some reading her story may think that she's simply raging against the police in order to have someone to blame for her immense loss. This proves that it's not the case. Carol would have gratefully sung the praises of all police officers involved, if only they had given her the slightest reason to. Throughout the story, I find Carol's assessments of the police's actions factual and fair. And in my opinion, that makes the way she would be treated after the discovery of her daughter's body even more outrageous and shocking. Carol tried to get hold of Kotza. He was once again unavailable. She phoned his landline, and the person that answered told her that a different detective was going out to the scene. Kotza did phone Carol a little later. He told her that he was at the mortuary, and he asked Carol if Tracy had a tattoo of a dragon on her shoulder. This information was given to him as an identifying characteristic in the missing persons report. It was in Tracy's file. Had the man even read the file? It was confirmed that the body that had been found was that of Tracy Thompson, Carol's daughter, was no longer missing. Despite many people trying to convince her not to, Carol insisted on seeing Tracy's body. She felt that she needed to in order to understand that it was real. Tracy had worn a what-would-Jesus-do wristband, and her brother Glenn had asked for it. When Carol went to the mortuary, she had instructed several people to please keep the wristband and make sure it got back to her. Despite assurances that they would do so, the wristband went missing. Carol asked to be shown where they had found Tracy's body. She was accompanied by two officers and a few close family members. The officers got lost on the way there. They seemed to have no idea where the scene was, but eventually found the general area. Carol noticed that there was no sign of crime scene tape or any sort of demarcation of a protected scene. Before police could tell her where Tracy had lain, Carol was drawn to the spot. There was an indentation in the sand and stones where her body had been. Carol asked the policeman which way Tracy's body had been facing. Neither knew the answer. Captain Kotza who should have visited the scene while the body was still in situ, or at the very least viewed photographs of the scene, also did not know. Carol realised that the spot where her daughter had been was just a few hundred metres from where she and Glenn had stopped on the road on the first day of their search. She'd been right there. She was also not very far from the place where the canine units had discovered the decomposing cow's head. If police had not called off the search and gone just slightly further, they would have found her. This also begs the question, in my mind, how did the dogs not pick up Tracy's scent that day? There might be a few answers to that question. The first is, When the handlers assumed that they were reacting to the cow's head, they were actually reacting to Tracy's scent, but they were stopped before they could get to her. The second is that perhaps Tracy's body was not there that day. It is possible that she was placed there after the initial search, although not probable. The third possibility is something that I thought of when Carol was describing the procedure of the initial search. She mentioned that a volunteer from the search and rescue team and a member of the canine squad had gone to Tracy's cottage and retrieved the item of her clothing. I know that this may be a little far off left field, 
But what if they were not given an item of Tracy's clothing, but rather someone else's, either by accident or to intentionally throw off the dogs? When Carol and her family were leaving the scene, her sister had said that she'd found it strange that the police had not done anything about a green car she'd seen parked nearby when they arrived. Carol hadn't seen the car, but her sister said that it had been parked close to the scene when they arrived, and when the police car pulled in, it had driven off. The police didn't seem to notice it either. Carol and her husband wanted a specific pastor to head up Tracy's memorial service, and his only available date was two days from when Tracy's body was discovered. If they didn't take that opening, he would only be available again in a month. So Carol, amidst her devastation and grief, had to rush to try and arrange the memorial. The police had initially confirmed that Tracy's body would be available on the day. But on the morning of the memorial, Carol was told that they wanted to perform another autopsy to take tissue samples for testing, so they couldn't release the body. The memorial went ahead without Tracy's body being present. Tracy's friend Trudy attended the memorial, but her housemates Vilma and Wally did not. Tracy's body was eventually released, but there was a long waiting list for cremation, so her body was stored until an arrangement could be made. Shortly after Tracy's memorial, Wally had phoned Carol. He first said that he was calling to tell her that the police had not come to interview them yet, but quickly changed tack and mentioned that with Tracy gone, he didn't have transport and he needed to get to town to pick up spares so that he could fix his own vehicle. He wanted Carol to take him. I cannot believe this young man's goal. He'd admitted to returning Tracy's vehicle to her without petrol in it. He hadn't bothered to attend her memorial service. If he had really been so keen to give his statement to help out his deceased housemate, He could have contacted police himself and arranged to speak to them, but he did none of that. Instead, he seemed to think that Carol owed him something because her daughter was his transport, and since she was now dead, he couldn't get around. In the days after Tracy's body was discovered, Carol received no contact from police. She tried in vain to get hold of Kotzer. His cell phone was off and the office gave various excuses for his absence, including that he had been sent to Namibia to investigate a corporate theft. Once again, I'm not an expert in police investigation, but shouldn't a murder take precedence over the theft of some computers from a company who should be insured to replace them anyway? Carol eventually managed to get hold of Kotzer, and asked him whether he knew the time and day of death yet. Kotzer said that the samples had been sent to the lab along with a rape kit, but they did not have results yet. Carol phoned the mortuary, and she was told that it could take up to 18 months for results to come back. When Carol had initially spoken to Kotzer about the rope that was found around Tracy's neck, he had told her that it had been a Hessian rope. When Carol asked the mortuary employee, he said it was a nylon ski rope. One day in April, Carol had a very strong feeling that she should stop Tracy's cremation. She contacted the funeral home, and they said that they were about to phone her to tell her that they had an opening the next day for cremation, but they would postpone now. Carol found a pathologist called Dr. Pamela Kloppers. She was a state pathologist, but she had permission to perform private autopsies. Arrangements were made to transport Tracy's body to Kloppers' facility. Unfortunately, due to the passage of time, Tracy's body was already quite far in the decomposition process, which would make certain parts of the autopsy difficult for Dr. Kloppers. She promised to do her best, though. 
The initial report from Dr. Kloppers was shocking. The pathologist who had done the first assessment had put the cause of death down as strangulation. Dr. Kloppers did not agree with this. The hyoid bone in Tracy's neck was not broken. The force required to strangle a human being would ordinarily break this bone. Kloppers informed Carol that while there was a wire cut on Tracy's body, the cut performed in order to gain access to internal organs, none of Tracy's organs had been taken out to be examined. There were also no signs that any tissue samples had been taken from Tracy's body. No autopsy had been conducted on Tracy, and when the police had claimed that the body could not be released for her memorial because they were taking samples, they had lied. The shocking revelations did not stop there. Dr. Kloppers phoned the lab, and she was told that they had no rape kit for Tracy. The clothes that she had been wearing at the time of her death were damp from dew when she was found. Instead of being allowed to dry and bagged for evidence collection, the clothes were all stuffed, wet and together in one bag, where they had been left to grow mould, effectively destroying any evidence that could be found on them. Dr. Kloppers found a crack pipe in Tracy's shorts. This should have been collected as evidence and fingerprinted, but after almost a month in a wet pair of shorts in a plastic bag, it was so rusted that there was no way prints could be obtained. Dr. Kloppers asked Carol to arrange that the police drop off the photographs of the scene as well as the rope that had been around her neck. This would help her to understand whether the marks on her neck were consistent with the rope and the photographs, could show her the type of knot, which would tell her whether it was possible for the rope to have been used in that manner to strangle her. Unsurprisingly at this point, Carol found it extremely difficult to get hold of Kotza. She eventually phoned the mortuary instead, and spoke to the employee she had dealt with in the past. She told him that she knew that he and Kotza had lied to her, and that an autopsy had never been performed on her daughter, and there were no samples at the lab. The mortuary employee's first response was that he thought Tracy had been cremated already. I guess that says it all. They thought that the evidence of their lies had been destroyed already. They never for a minute expected Carol to arrange a private post-mortem. The mortuary employee eventually admitted that he had prepared Tracy's body for the post-mortem by performing the Y-cut. When the state pathologist had arrived to perform the autopsy, he had read the case file and noted that Tracy had been found with a rope around her neck. The pathologist had immediately said that it was therefore clear that she had been strangled and written up his report without even having touched Tracy's body. He further admitted that they had never taken any samples from the body for testing, nor had they conducted a rape kit on her. Two photographs of the scene would eventually make their way to Dr. Kloppers. When she asked for the rest, she was told that that was all there was. Two photographs had been taken of a murder scene. Neither photograph showed Tracy's face, nor did it show the rope. Dr. Kloppers had wanted to see what Tracy's face looked like when she was found, so that they could determine whether she had perhaps been suffocated. Due to the advanced stage of decomposition in which Kloppers had seen Tracy, it was impossible to determine whether there was bruising on her face, which could be consistent with suffocation. Now, they would never know. It would later emerge that the rope had been lost. No one could find it in the evidence store. Dr. Kloppers took her own tissue samples and rape kit. To avoid any more additional costs for the family, she handed the samples over to the police so that they could submit it to their lab. After a long wait and no results from the lab, Carol had phoned them herself. The lab assistant was shocked that Tracy was a murder victim. 
the police had not communicated that fact to them. The lab employee said that if they had known she w- it was a murder investigation, they would have made the results high priority. When Carol confronted Kortzer about not having told the lab that the samples were for a murder case, he told her that it would have made no difference. The lab employee had clearly said it would have made all the difference. Three months after Tracy's murder, Carol decided to contact a private investigator. The family was not wealthy to begin with, and the cost of all that they'd have to do to make up for the police's pathetic work were mounting. Carol had, of course, also missed a lot of work for which she was not being paid. There was therefore very little money available for a private investigator, but she felt that she had to try. She contacted a few PIs, all of which wanted many thousands of rands before they even heard the details of the case. Carol eventually got hold of a PI she refers to in the book as Connor. He seemed different. He wouldn't give Carol a price until he had met with her and understood the case. From the outset, Carol found that the PI conducted the investigation the way the police always should have. Even though the PI had been contacted by Carol and her husband, their initial questioning at the first meeting was clearly to determine whether either of them had any involvement in Tracy's murder. Although this must have been difficult for Carol and her husband, it was correct procedure. Most murder victims are killed by someone close to them. When you investigate a murder, you always move from the inside out, first ensuring that you can discount the people closest to the victim, including parents and siblings, before moving out to partners, then friends and eventually acquaintances. The PI then started to visit the important sites in the investigation and plotted three critical points. Tracy's body had been found on the left-hand side of the road that led from her cottage to the highway, as though she'd been leaving. But the car's direction showed that it was headed back to the cottage. They wondered whether she'd been trying to walk home, but Tracy was terrified of the dark. The PI was able to question Tracy's friend Trudy, who identified the crack pipe that was found in Tracy's shorts as belonging to Wally. Vilma and Wally, however, had disappeared. Trudy had no idea where they were living now. The housemates had never been questioned by the police. Carol eventually managed to find a number for Vilma, and when she answered, she admitted that she and Wally had moved to Cape Town. Carol asked to speak to Wally, but he refused to come to the phone. Vilma then whispered to Carol that if she called at a specific time the next day, Wally would not be home and she could speak more freely. Carol called at the arranged time and Vilma gave her the name of the streets and suburb they lived in, but wouldn't give her the street number. I'm sorry, but this is a major red flag. Your housemate is horrifically murdered and you don't want to speak to her mother, and you won't give your full address? Why? If you've got nothing to hide, give a statement and be done with it. Why all the cloak and dagger stuff? It would be easy for them to say that they simply did not want to get involved, but you're already involved. The murder victim lived in the same house as you. You were possibly the last people to see her alive. You're in the thick of it, whether you like it or not. As a human being, surely you would want to at least give any information you have to help the investigation. After all, nothing you say is going to implicate you, is it? As we know Carol by now, she was not taking no for an answer. Carol arranged for the co-worker of a friend who lived in the same suburb in Cape Town that Vilma had mentioned, to scour the streets in the afternoon when people would be coming home from work. They were given a description of Vilma and Wally. And one afternoon, 
spotted the couple arriving home. The person took down their license plate number and gave it to Carol. Carol contacted the licensing department and pretended that the owners of the vehicle had assisted her on the road and she wanted to thank them. The licensing department gave Carol the address registered to the vehicle. Four months after Tracy's death, the private investigator flew to Cape Town and interviewed Wally and Vilma. Wally denied any knowledge of the crack pipe that Trudy had identified as belonging to him. The following was his version of events that he gave to the private investigator. He had last seen Tracy leaving their cottage. It had been dark, and she'd gotten into her car and freewheeled down to the gate. She'd gotten out and opened the gate and then driven out onto the road. That was the last time he had seen her, and she'd never returned home. He could not explain why he'd allowed Tracy to take a vehicle that he knew had no petrol in it. It emerged that Wally's kit bag had been in Tracy's vehicle when she went missing. The kit bag contained tools that he used in his job as a mechanic. But Wally had never asked after the whereabouts of the bag, and it was not in the vehicle when it was recovered. He could not explain why he'd never asked for it. Trudy had said that Wally was wearing a different colour tracksuit pants when he woke up than she had seen him wearing when he'd allegedly gone to bed. He couldn't explain why he would have changed his pants in the middle of the night either. When the PI returned from Cape Town, he and his partner went out to the cottage to test Wally's version of events. They went at night so that the conditions could be the same as he claimed in his statement. The PI's forensic team had done a full sweep of Tracy's vehicle. While Carol and Glenn had found the items inside the car, they hadn't thought to check the boot. In the boot of Tracy's car, the forensics team found a piece of nylon ski rope. They found another pendant that matched the one with the bird on that Carol had found inside the car. No one that Tracy knew had ever seen her wearing such pendants. More pieces of paper were found with telephone numbers in writing that didn't match Tracy's. A plastic shopping bag with men's clothing in it was also found in the boot. When the PIs attended the cottage, they found another piece of nylon ski rope that matched the piece that they'd found in Tracy's boot. That could have been significant evidence if the piece of rope from Tracy's neck had not been lost. If the rope from the cottage matched the rope from the car and the rope around her neck, that would have been indicative that someone from the cottage was involved in Tracy's death. The PIs could not reconstruct Wally's version of events at the cottage. At the time that he claimed to have seen Tracy pulling out the gate, it was far too dark on the small holding to see anything that was happening at the gate. It could therefore not be true. The only way Wally could have known what Tracy had done was if he was in the car with her. Trudy further stated that Tracy would hardly ever leave the house after dark, and if she did, she would wake her up and tell her that she was going out. She had not said a word to Trudy that night about going out. Carol arranged a meeting with Captain Kortza and the PIs, so that they could hand over the evidence they had collected and give them Vilma and Wally's statements. Kortzer showed little interest in the evidence they had, and also couldn't answer the questions the PI had for him. Wally had agreed to take a polygraph test, and the PI told Kortzer that he and his team could fly to Cape Town and get it done immediately with their permission. Kortzer said that wouldn't be necessary. They could either get Wally back from Cape Town, or they would get a team from Cape Town to take the statement and perform the polygraph. Kortzer promised to do this within the next three days. By now, I don't think I need to tell you that that did not happen. Carol lodged a complaint against the state pathologist who had failed to complete a proper post-mortem 
with the Medical Professionals Council. She received a response that their investigation would take a few months. Cavill received daily updates from the private investigator. He also asked her to set up an appointment for him with Dr. Kloppers. In the meeting, Dr. Kloppers said that she believed that Tracy's body could have been staged as a cover-up for a drug-related death. A small amount of cocaine had been found in her stomach tissue, but it was nowhere near enough to have killed her. Unfortunately, because the samples had been taken so long after her death, it was impossible to tell whether the level had always been so low or if it had degraded during decomposition. Carol was shocked to hear that cocaine had been found in Tracy's body, as she had always only known her to use Dacha in ecstasy. Tracy also had a deep hatred for cocaine after Peter had died from using it. The exact time and date of death was impossible to determine by the time Dr. Kloppers had seen Tracy's body, as she explained that the coolers at the state mortuary were overworked and often didn't work at the temperature they were supposed to. She guessed that this was also the reason that no time or date of death was on the official report either. Kloppers told the PI that she believed that Tracy was killed by someone she knew and trusted. Carol had also laid an official complaint against Kotza, and the answer she got back was that it was believed that the investigation had been satisfactory. She then escalated her complaint to the Commissioner of Police, who arranged a meeting with all the parties involved. On the day of the meeting, she was introduced to a new detective, Inspector Pierce. Captain Kotza had been taken off the case and had been handed over to the Serious and Violent Crimes Unit, at which Pierce was stationed. Carol had been asking for the case to be given to the unit for months, and her request had always been declined. Carol thought that someone was eventually taking her seriously, but it emerged a few days later that the investigative programme carte blanche had been in touch with the commissioner a few days before the meeting. They were doing a piece on unsolved murder cases that had been bungled by police, and they were including Tracy's case. The press attention was the real reason for the case being upgraded and Pierce being put in charge. Whatever the reason, Carol admits that Pierce seemed very different to Kortza at the outset. He was in regular contact and gave her updates without her having to beg for them. During that meeting, though, Carol noticed that there was some serious tension between her private investigator and Pierce. They didn't seem to like each other at all. In the coming weeks and months, Pierce would constantly try and convince Carol that she should fire the private investigator. She refused. The PI had been the only person that had ever made any progress on Tracy's case. There was no way that Carol was parting ways with him just yet. Three months after the PI's meeting with Kotza, they eventually received answers to the questions they had asked. When asked why Tracy's clothing had not been properly treated and forwarded for testing, Kotza lied and said it was the mortuary's responsibility to do this. When asked if they had questioned anyone in the vicinity of the crime, he said no, because there was no indication they had committed a crime. There were huge compounds of workers that lived within a two-kilometre area of where Tracy was found. Hundreds of possible witnesses. Not a single one was questioned. This makes absolutely no sense. How would you know if they hadn't committed a crime if they weren't questioned? they may well have seen something even if they weren't involved. Prostitutes had been working 20 metres from where Tracy was found. They were also not questioned. Ridiculously, Kotza said that he was sure that they would have reported something if they had any information. Yes, Captain Kotza, I'm sure that these ladies who are so friendly with police and not doing anything illegal at all 
are going to walk right into a police station and report information they have. What a load of nonsense. It also emerged that Kotza had no idea that Tracy's body had been found, until he saw that Carol was trying to get hold of him. He'd never been to the scene. Inspector Pierce contacted Carol to break the news that the rape kit that Dr. Kloppers had taken from Tracy had never gone to the lab. He had been trying to find the rope in the evidence locker and found the kit sitting there leaking. He told Carol that he had now sent it off for testing, but even if the DNA was not too degraded for testing and they managed to get a result, the chain of evidence had been broken, so they would not be able to use it in a trial anyway. It would take another six months for the results to come back from the lab. Ten months after Tracy was killed, police eventually took a statement from her friend Trudy. Wally and Vilma had still not been spoken to by police. Almost a year after Tracy's death, the private investigator told Carol that he had reached the end of the road in his investigation. He could do no more without the police's cooperation, and although he had offered a significant reward, he had received no workable leads. The PI told Carol that he believed that Wally had somehow been involved in Tracy's death. At the very least, he knew what happened. His statements were too inconsistent to be true, the PI felt. Without the police identifying Wally as a suspect and following up on his statements, though, they would get no further. Carol states in the book that she feels forever indebted to the PI she calls Connor. His firm didn't even charge her family for the bulk of work they did, and their account was significantly discounted. In the first few months after Tracy's death, Carol had shied away from the media, unwilling to talk and concerned that if she did, it would harm the case. With everything having come to a standstill, she now embraced the media's requests for interviews and became quite close with one journalist that she refers to as Serena. Around the one-year anniversary of Tracy's death, her brother Glenn tried to contact Pierce to get an update. He did not get hold of Pierce, but he was told by the person he spoke to that the police would no longer be speaking to the family on the phone or in person, and that they should address all of their questions to them by email. Carol was flabbergasted at the sudden turn of events, and phoned Pierce herself. He claimed to have no idea what Glenn was talking about, and then, before putting down the phone, made an off-handed comment that Tracy's rape kit results had come back a month before, and no semen could be identified. He hadn't even bothered to let Carol know. If she hadn't phoned that day, she may have never known. Carol arranged another meeting with two police commissioners and Pierce. Again, many promises were made and none were kept. Eventually, 14 months after Tracy had been murdered, police interviewed Wally and Vilma for the first time. Wally's story was suddenly very different from what he had told the PR. He now claimed that Tracy had introduced him to drugs. Carol knew that this was a lie, because she had known Wally to be a drug user long before Tracy was. Wally said that on the night that Tracy had disappeared, they had decided that they wanted drugs, and he had given Tracy 200 rand to go and buy cocaine for them. She had left the cottage to go to their dealer, and never returned. He claimed that he had waited for a few hours and then just went to sleep. When he woke up in the morning, he realised that Tracy still wasn't back. Although he'd previously agreed to take a polygraph, he now refused. Wally's story stinks of lies to me. What drug addict gives money to someone else, sends them off in a car they know has no petrol in it, and then is okay with it when the person doesn't return with their drugs. 
it is far more likely that if there really was an arrangement to get drugs, Wally would have gone with Tracy. In September of 2006, Carol was advised that an inquest was going to be held into Tracy's death. They arrived on the morning indicated at court. They'd been told that the inquest would be held in the courtroom and open to the public, so Carol took her journalist friend, Serena, with. Carol, her husband Buddy, and Serena sat waiting for hours to be called. Eventually, they were approached and told that things had changed and the inquest would be held in the magistrate's chambers instead. This, of course, meant that Serena could not be present. It was claimed that additional items had been added to the court roll for the day, which resulted in the change. But I think it's pretty clear that someone had figured out that the Thompsons had a journalist with them and found a way to ensure that she could be excluded. Carol and Buddy entered the magistrate's chambers, and he introduced himself. Carol describes him as a polite and kind man. He offered his condolences for their loss, and then stated that, in his opinion, the initial investigation had been an absolute disgrace. But he could only make a ruling on the information he had at his disposal. Carol would realise what he meant when she saw the docket on his desk. It was, in her words, anorexic. So thin, you would think that it was a case of petty theft and not murder. When he started going through the docket, Carol realised that the documents and evidence in there were dated six months after Tracy's death, when Pierce had taken over the investigation. There was not a single document from the time that Kotzer had been on the case. The magistrate ruled that the police should continue to actively investigate Tracy's death. Although there was significant evidence that Tracy was not strangled, the official cause of death remained strangulation. The magistrate told Carol that he would personally deliver the docket back to the police station because he was concerned that if he left it to someone else, it may disappear. Shortly after the inquest, the Serious and Violent Crimes Unit was shut down. All of the officers working at the unit were sent to work at individual police stations. Pierce complained to Carol that his caseload had now tripled, and he had asked for Tracy's case to be given to another detective, but his request had been declined. Around the same time, Carol received a response to her complaint to the Medical Professionals Council. They had determined that the original pathologist had done nothing wrong. When Carol inquired about what process they had followed to determine this, they responded saying that they had held a hearing. Well, only the pathologist that was being investigated could have attended that hearing because Dr. Kloppers was never called to testify. It is deeply concerning to me that the council will find it acceptable for a state pathologist to lie about having performed an autopsy and not perform all the tests required to properly determine cause of death. The man determined cause of death by a line written in a case file. How is that due diligence? Why do we even have postmortems then? We can just give the case file to an admin clerk and let them decide from what's written in there how someone died. It's honestly ludicrous in my humble opinion. Carol managed to get a copy of the docket she had seen at the magistrate's office and arranged a meeting with the commissioner, Pierce and Kortza. She also asked Serena to be present. The commissioner agreed to the meeting, but was very unhappy that a journalist was there and insisted that he be allowed to approve anything she wrote before she published it. Carol describes Kotzer arriving for their meeting that day, completely calm and relaxed. She offered him coffee. He said he'd prefer a Coke. She got the feeling that he really felt as though he'd done nothing wrong. Pierce, on the other hand, appeared more stressed out, 
probably realizing that he was currently responsible for whatever came out of that meeting. Carol started by asking Kotso what type of rope had been around Tracy's neck. Kotso immediately said that he clearly recalled it was Hessian because you don't see a lot of Hessian rope anymore. Carol then asked why the mortuary assistant who had removed the rope from Tracy's neck had told her that it was nylon ski rope. Kotsa couldn't explain this, and then agreed that maybe his memory wasn't that good after all. Honestly, I don't think that Kotsa ever saw that rope. I think that by the time he looked for it, if he ever did, it had been lost. The commissioner then suggested that they just look at the crime scene photos because that would answer their question. Carol eagerly agreed, knowing full well that the rope was not in the pictures. Pierce handed the commissioner the two photographs. He looked at them and then asked for the rest. Pierce informed him that that was all there was. Only two photos had been taken. He insisted there must be more. Pierce confirmed that there was not. Highly embarrassed and probably suddenly realising for the first time how absolutely disgracefully his officers had conducted themselves, the commissioner changed tack. He agreed that there had been significant problems with the investigation, but assured Carol that Tracy's case would now be escalated to an active investigation and they would leave no stone unturned. A few days later, a policeman contacted Carol, demanding that her PI hand over his new evidence to them within 24 hours. Somewhere along the line, broken telephone had caused someone to believe that new evidence had been alluded to in the meeting, probably because Carol had told the commissioner that her PI had given evidence to Kotza, which was never processed. Carol tried to explain this to the man on the phone, but he continued to insist that he would arrest the PI if he didn't comply. Suddenly, extremely tired of dealing with the absolute ineptitude she'd been fighting for almost two years, she told the police officer to do his own dirty work and arrest whomever he wished. That was the last time that Carol Thompson ever heard from the South African Police Service. In the 14 years since Tracy Thompson's murder, no further progress has been made into the investigation, and Carol and her family have had to move forward and build a new life on the ruins of the life they shared with Tracy. Writing the book Betrayed was Carol's way of making people understand that investigations do not always go the way they should, And it was a warning to other families dealing with similar situations that you cannot always trust those who are placed in a position of power. Due to all the bungling, we will never even know for sure how Tracy died. It doesn't seem that she was sexually assaulted. And it does seem that the manner in which her body was found was a staged scene. The question is, who staged it and why? Let's play devil's advocate and say that part of Wally's story is true and he and Tracy did want to score drugs that night. As I mentioned, I would find it far more likely that he had gone with Tracy to buy the drugs. Perhaps the petrol level on the car was very low, but not so low that it wouldn't drive, or at least a distance. Maybe Tracy and Wally did get the drugs, and they used immediately in the car after leaving the dealer. Perhaps Tracy, having been clean for a significant period, used the same amount she ordinarily would, and her body, not being used to drugs anymore, overdosed. It is possible that they were near the cottage when this happened, and that's why the vehicle was pulled over. Had Wally panicked, stopped the vehicle from the passenger seat, dragged Tracy out and posed her body to make it look like she'd been raped and murdered. He would, after all, have some responsibility in her death if he'd purchased the drugs that killed her. There is also a possibility 
that none of that happened, and Tracy had been angry that her vehicle had been returned with no petrol, an altercation had broken out, which resulted in Tracy's death. There's a further possibility that the housemates had absolutely no role in her death, and she was attacked and killed by a complete stranger. I highly doubt that this is the case, though, considering, as far as we know, there was no sign of violence on her body. Again, in the absence of a proper post-mortem, before her body had begun the decomposition process, there is no way for us to know that for sure either. The state of Tracy's car concerns me. It's almost like it was in the possession of someone else for a decent length of time. Who did all of the items found in the vehicle belong to? I have this weird idea that someone wanted to trade that car for drugs. And I don't think that person was Tracy. Or maybe they succeeded in trading the car for drugs. And that's why Tracy had to be killed. I must, of course, put on record that these are all just possible scenarios that are formed in my mind due to the evidence in front of me. They are essentially my opinions, because we have absolutely no proof of what really happened, nor who was responsible. Maybe Wally is completely innocent and was just confused, and that's why his statements didn't make sense. If that's the case then it's really time he comes forward and tells his story. So, Wally, if you're listening to this, well, you know your name really isn't Wally, but you know who you are. Why not break the silence? Why not just let the family cross you off their list of possibilities? I think they deserve that, after all they've had to go through. I think that your friend Tracy, who helped you with transport and lived in the same house as you, deserves that too, don't you? I'm under no illusions that this podcast will help to crack this case, but I do hope that it will restart the conversation about the unsolved murder of Tracy Thompson. Carol has stopped fighting the police to do their job, because it really won't change anything. It won't bring her daughter back. And if they were ever really going to do their job, they had the opportunity 14 years ago. Carol now uses her time to ensure that Glenn still has a mother and her husband still has a wife. She's not given up hope, though. In a WhatsApp message she sent to me when I told her I'd be covering the case, she said, quote, I still live with a jiggle of hope that one day someone will talk in a pub about getting away with murder. Not that it will bring Trace back, but at least I will know when, how, who, and why. End quote. I'm quite certain that you, like me, are going to be very angry and very sad after listening to this episode, because this family and Tracy was really dragged through the ringer by the system, and it seems like there is just nothing that can be done to change it. I also wonder how many other families have had to deal with the same treatment. So what can we do? I'll place a link to Carol Thompson's Facebook page for the book in the show notes. If you'd like to, you could maybe head over there and write a message of support on her page. Let her know that you care, and that one more person knows about Tracy's story. Something else you can do is share and talk about Tracy's case with friends and family. By restarting the public conversation about this case, you never know whose memory you may jog or whose conscience you may twig. One of the few positive things about a case going cold is that with the passage of time, people's situations change. Someone who was scared 14 years ago might feel free to talk now. So let's talk about Tracy Thompson and the injustice that befell her and her family. It's the least we can do. I don't like having to cover cases that have been so badly bungled by the police. 
I respect what they do, and I do believe that there were flashes of good police work in this case. There was also a severe lack of accountability, though. While I fully understand that our police service is wholly overwhelmed for the resources available to them, and I'm pretty sure that the situation now is probably even worse than it was in 2005, there's got to be some sense of responsibility. No matter what profession you're talking about, there's always going to be people who are good at their jobs, hardworking and committed, and there are going to be people who shouldn't be in the positions they're in. Where it makes a huge difference is when the profession in question has people's lives in their hands. That makes all the difference. Thank you for listening to Tracy's story. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe on the app you're listening on and weigh in on our discussion on our social media pages. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Don't forget to look out for the link in the show notes to buy the amazing book Blood on Her Hands. I'll be posting about it on social media too. I really appreciate your support for the podcast and I'll chat to you soon.